this PowerPoint uh, be made available <laughs> after. <laughs> yes, you will be able to view this presentation um, at the Take a Bay Search website and also at halterproject.org on our YouTube channel. And I think Fire Safe Sonoma may actually share this. So, yes. Um, I am going to run a little long because we're only at part three and I'm trying to go as fast as I can. So let's launch. All right, so we've talked about situational awareness. We've talked about the difference between emergencies and disasters. We've talked about making a plan. Now we're getting into the nitty gritty planning and prepping your animals. So this section is about all animals, but it's got a little bit more emphasis on pets. The section that follows this is going to focus a little more on large animals, but again, it's relevant to everybody. We've already said it a couple of times, have more than one plan. Having an evacuation plan also means having a backup plan. And it also means having a good shelter in place plan. Sheltering in place is an important part of planning because there could very well be times when emergency managers tell us to shelter in place. And usually that's around a local emergency. And there may be times when we simply can't evacuate safely. Okay, next slide. Have more than one plan means assess the risks. Your plans are going to be based upon your hazard and risk assessment. Might your animals be safer at home? How safely can you get everybody loaded and on the road? Can you yourself get all of your animals out of your house and into a car. So lots and lots and lots of variables. What might happen between your home and your evacuation destination? So have a plan and have more than one plan. Next slide. Your disaster action plan. All right, we're gonna assume that you guys have it because you're here. When's the last time you updated it? Okay, make it updated, keep it refreshed and uh, make sure that it always includes your updated emergency contacts, microchip information, ID tags, uh, information about your animal tattoos if they have them and brands. So that's photo ID, photos and registration documents, including photos of you with your animals, uh, current vet records, vaccination info, medication and dosage information. You might not be able to keep all that in your brain, so have it in writing. And it's really important to have an advanced care directive. What if something happens to you and the people caring for your pets um, have questions about how you would like them to be cared for. So make sure that that's part of your disaster action plan. Make sure it's part of the binder, the folder of the file that goes with you when you evacuate. Next slide. Keep your contacts updated and handy. Can't say it enough and keep them in multiple formats. Next. Keep things calm and keep the animals secure. So this means again, staying calm, so your animals and everybody around you can feel calmer. Keep your animals in a quiet, secure place until you're ready to load. I think this is one of the single most important animal preparedness items. And I really want you to listen and you know, log this in your brain. Keep those animals in a quiet, secure place so they can't run out the door, so they can't hide under the bed or get into the mattress of the sofa bed. Make sure that your pets are secure inside the car. Evacuating in a pandemic means that you might be stuck at a temporary evacuation point for a long, long time. And as soon as somebody rolls down the window to get your information, you don't want your animal jumping out. And it happens, and it's happened way too often. So make sure they're secure in the car. Keep them in their carrier. Have a, a car seat harness or a seat belt harness for your pets keep them with you and keep them safe. Make sure everyone is ID'd, every animal, big or small. And make sure your pets are secure at your, vaccination, at your evacuation destination. I can't tell you how many sad stories we hear on the hotlines. I got out, I evacuated safely. I got everybody to my, uh, my evacuation destination, my friend's house. And then the kids opened the bedroom door and the cat got out, the dog ran through the front door. 
so sad. Now your animal is lost in unfamiliar surroundings. So it's called a secondary evacuation emergency. Next slide. Keep your animals, I'm sorry. <laughs> My eyes get a little tired. Prep, 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 prep. Keep them safe and prep your animals for evacuation or sheltering in place. So know your alerts and know the stages of evacuation because evacuating early is the single greatest lifesaver. We like to say over and over again that for every animal or person for that matter, that we rescue hundreds or thousands more will be saved by advanced preparation and education. So know the stages of evacuation, weather alerts, advisories, warnings, and watches. Those give us um, days, sometimes even weeks to prepare. That's when you make your final uh, preparations and you could be ready to go very quickly. Once you get an evacuation warning, that really is the time to go. And if you have large animals, you should actually go before that. With large animals, you should leave before you get an evacuation warning. You should leave during that weather advisory, that weather watch. Uh, evacuation order, your life is in danger. You need to get out now. You may or may not be able to get your animals out with you, but you leave. Once you get yourself to safety, you can then call and request help for the animals that were left behind. Shelter in place, SIP or sheltering in place. Um, often this happens in a local emergency. It could be a broken water main or um, a house or apartment fire or broken gas line, or it could be a police action, but authorities are going to issue an alert and they're going to tell you to shelter in place. That means do not move, do not leave until authorities tell you it's safe to go out. In a disaster, sheltering in place is what's gonna happen when you cannot evacuate safely or you can't take your animals with you for whatever reason. So know the stages of evacuation and know when to go. Next slide. Go bags and ready kits. What's the difference? There isn't one. Two names for the same thing. Your go bags and ready kits are the things that you pack to take with you for evacuation. They've got everything you need to keep you and your animals comfy, safe, and healthy for a few days, maybe a week. Next slide. Stay crates. Those are your emergency supplies. So, you know, we've been told to make sure that we keep and refresh and rotate every year, like our batteries and our smoke detectors. So these are your shelter in place supplies. It's everything you'll need for you and your animals if you must shelter in place. They, they should contain enough emergency supplies for sheltering in place for at least a month. They contain enough supplies, I'm sorry, they contain enough supplies for at least a month and that's everything you might need. And you store them in a safe, cool and accessible place or places. Next slide. Go bags for people and go bags for pets. Everything you need for yourself, you need for your animals. Next slide. Your personal important stuff. Again, if you don't have what you need, you're not gonna be able to take care of your animals. So make sure that when you grab and go, you've got all of your important documents, your phone and charger, your glasses or contacts, cash, ID, your prescriptions, your medications, sturdy shoes, layered clothes, your health and hygiene supplies, your PPE. Make sure that you have everything. I have friends who keep all that stuff with their pet ready kits because they say that they're gonna grab their pet kits and that way they know that all their personal important stuff is where their animal stuff. There's nothing wrong with that as long as you know where it is and you can grab it when you have to leave. Next slide. What do you need to take for evacuation when you're on the move? Well, basically your go bag, your secure carrier or car crates for your pets, everything you need to keep your pet comfy and healthy for a few days. Plus, and this is really important, enough medicine and enough special diet food for at least one month. Uh, this is really important. We're in the midst of some pretty serious supply chain issues. Um, if communications are down or computers are down, you may not be able to get that order or that prescription refill for your pet or their special food. So be on the safe side, 
overpack, take everything you can possibly fit in your car, or better yet, have backup stored at a friend's who's out, um, out of the area where the, an, an incident might happen. Uh, make sure that you are including a roomy secure cage, kennel, or enclosure, or a tank for your pets at your evacuation destination. And this really needs to be something that's big enough for your pet to stand up and walk around in. Next slide. How much do you need? Well, again, when you go, you need enough for a few days or a week. Your medications and special food, you need a lot more. When you're staying, you need enough for at least a month. I like to say at least four to six weeks. Next slide. Where to keep those gut bags and steak crates? People ask me this all the time. Well, the answer is keep them wherever you might need them. So again, you can't have just one. You might need a go bag under your desk at work. Uh, you might need it at a, a relative's house where you spend some time. When you travel, you usually have everything you need with you. And at home, make sure that you have them in a place you can get to them quickly. You can find them, you can see them, and they're going to be safe and accessible. Next slide. Oh, here's just a really handy chart that we actually created for a presentation a few months ago uh, that rates the most popular and readily available types of pet carriers. So again, we will have this available. It's kind of a good thing to look at. Next slide. At the Halter Project, one of um, our primary missions is to make sure that our communities wherever you may be, have access to good solid information to keep people and animals safe. We have a handout for just about everything. This is just a, a photo of a few of the pet ready kit or pet and large animal ready kit checklist that we have. You can find all of these at our website and you can download and print any of them, totally free. All our resources are no cost to you. Next slide. What do you need to pack in your car or the person who's taking you for evacuation destination or sheltering in place? This is like a pop quiz. Everything you need for yourself, you need to have for your animals. It's that simple. Next slide. This includes sanitation and hygiene for your animals and for you. It's never been more important and it's not just about the toilet paper. Next slide. Health and comfort items. So these include things that will keep your pet comfy and warm or cool. Climate, uh, climate control is really important. A cage, cage or enclosure that's big enough for them to move around in. Uh, grooming supplies, toys and treats, things to keep them occupied and enriched. Next slide. Documents, again, we've talked about this a bunch of times, but make sure that everything you have for yourself, you also have for your pet. So vet records, health records, photo ID, uh, prescriptions, advanced care directive, um, have several pet at home cards filled out in advance in case you have to leave without them. You'll know right where to find them. Next slide. Again, if you're not safe, they're not safe. If we're not safe, neither are our animals. So pack so that you and your helper can safely walk and carry your go kits and your pets and enter your car. Think about a variety of bags, don't overload. What can you carry on your back? Uh, I like fanny packs carried in front. I love crossbody bags. You see one right there in turquoise in the, in the um, photo. I like to use a variety of bags so that everything I'm carrying is balanced and most importantly, it leaves my hands free or at least one hand free for the dog on the leash, the cat on the harness or your cane or maybe even a walker. So you need to think about how you're going to move safely with all the stuff that you have to carry, including your pets. Next slide. Better mobility safety. Um, if you are relying on senior transportation or paratransit, usually the drivers are really helpful, but you might be alone. And um, this gentleman only has his carrier to worry about, but what if he were loaded down with a couple of backpacks and a walker or a cane? So it's gonna take him a lot longer. So 
planning for evacuation, again, means knowing when to go and giving yourself plenty of time because when you have animals, everything is going to take longer. And if you can't move around quite as quickly as you used to, it's going to take longer still. Next slide. Go kit tips. Again, everything we've just talked about. Think about how you're gonna pack your car, how much room do you have? Um, are you gonna be able to lift things in and out? Is there room for your pet? Uh, this is a picture with actually a bunch of my stuff and that's Shiloh, hi Shiloh and her dog Jasper. And um, so this is, this is real time, this is real life. She's, she's got a cute little Subaru. Um, so it's compact, it's got a lot of space, but it starts to fill up really quickly. So make everything count, make every bag count. No wasted space and make sure there's room for your pet to stay comfortable and secure. Next slide. Plan ahead, how much can you carry? Again, if you're fortunate enough to have a US Forest Service mule pack team at your disposal, hey, no worries, you've got it covered. But uh, most of us don't. So that means that you really have to plan carefully. If you're campers, you know this really well. If you are a person who doesn't camp, but you have friends who are campers, pick their brains, get them to help you plan how to pack because campers are the pros. Next slide. Sheltering in place with your animals or sheltering your animals in place without you. When evacuation isn't possible, your pet stay crate should include your go bag plus enough additional food, medication, sanitation, and hygiene supplies for at least a month. So if you are trapped at your home with your animals, you need to make sure that your stay crates have everything you need for the animals for an extended period. And we're most likely talking here about um, a, a post flood earthquake or tsunami type situation where help can't get to us and we can't get out safely. You can make a separate pet stake crate or you can add your items to your own personal stake crates. Do whatever you have the space for. Make sure you pack your crates in waterproof and rodent proof totes that you can move easily. It's not gonna do you any good if you have this great crate in the basement, you can't carry it up the stairs or out the door. Store them in a safe, accessible place. And remember to refresh your items every year. Next slide. Practice, practice, practice. You guys all know this one, but practice with your pets, practice with your mini donks, practice with your pigs. Practice loading in every kind of situation, in the daytime, in the nighttime, and get a total stranger to practice. Get your safety net helpers to practice with your animals so that they're comfortable doing it with someone other than you. Next slide. Prep for animals inside a mandatory evacuation zone. What does this mean? It means that you're gonna follow the instructions in your emergency alerts. You're gonna call the animal hotline number to get help for the animals who are inside mandatory evac or in an evacuation zone under an evacuation order. You're going to give calm, clear details, be ready to provide contact info, your address, crossroads, landmarks, numbers, and the types of animals. So again, giving really good information that's gonna enable the dispatcher to convey to the responder in the best possible way, how to find your animals and get to them quickly. If you can leave a key hidden or on your way out, stop at animal control or sometime, uh, sometimes the temporary evacuation center will have a pop-up set up where you can give your house key to um, an agency official. And that's really important. Next slide. We have lots and lots of information available in multiple languages. So we have a packet for almost everything. And again, you can find them at halterproject.org. We're just gonna flip through these slides really quickly because they just show you a handful of the kinds of things we have available. Um, you can find these or we can make them available at no cost to your agency or organization. So next slide. Next slide. Next slide. These are really important. So on the, oops, uh, on the left, you saw a red 
um, animal at home card. And on the right, you saw a yellow one that was in Spanish. So these are the cards that you fill out in advance and you're going to tape them to a place that responders will see them. And it's going to tell them about the animals that you have inside, okay? The animals at home, inside your house, in your backyard, somewhere on your property. And again, we have lots of materials in Spanish and English. Next slide. And again, Spanish and English. On the left, we have a great handbook for our non-English speaking ag workers and their English speaking supervisors. So ways to help your workers prepare and care for the animals, because often they are the ones who are going to be on site when something happens. It's really important that we keep them safe and help them know how to keep the animals safe. Next slide. And get the kids involved. We have great coloring books that are bilingual. So it's a great way um, to get our um, bilingual kids um, involved with their parents and maybe their grandparents and each other. So lots of materials. And again, they're free from halterproject.org. Next slide. Resources. So these are just a few of the packets that we just showed you. And they're all available for the asking at halterproject.org. And this brings us to <laughs> the end of part three. Uh, we have not yet gotten to part four or five, but we are sadly almost at the end of um, our time. Now we can go to a little closer to eight o'clock and I welcome as many of you who want to, to stay with us. It looks like a lot of you are still with us. So instead of pausing for a break for questions, I'm gonna blast through our next section which is focused a little more on your large animals. But don't despair if you have pets, just about everything we say in the following information is going to be relevant to them too. I'm gonna to take a quick sip here, next slide. Know the evacuation risks. With animals, this is so true. Um, shelters can fill up very quickly. Your animals could be exposed to um, infectious disease. That's a really big one. And they're gonna be more prone to getting sick because they're likely to be stressed out in an emergency shelter. If you are going to go, again, go before it's mandatory. Go before you get that warning. Go before the roads fill up. Go before the shelters fill up. Do everything you can to de-escalate the stress of evacuation. What are some of the other risks? Uh, boy, hazardous roads, stalled vehicles, which can hold you up, put you into um, further dangerous situations. Your vehicle could break down, especially if it's hot. Overheated vehicles is one of the number one causes of uh, massive jams during evacuations. And that's on top of the hundreds or thousands of vehicles that are on the road. Fuel shortages, we've all been there and we could be looking at that again really soon. Dangerous weather conditions, which can definitely include a storm, wind, flying debris, and of course, smoke. Um, reunification can sometimes be difficult, especially if you weren't prepared and your animal goes into a shelter without adequate identification. Uh, bad identification, again, it's always a good idea to have more than one type. Even if your animal's microchip, put some kind of visible ID on them. It's really helpful. Next slide. Evacuation planning means assessing the risks. Can your horses and other animals be safely transported? Think about your oldies, the ones that are lame or blind. Um, it's going to be really scary for them. If you're going to be evacuating them, make sure you do it under the best possible circumstances, meaning really early, really early, and leave plenty of time. How much time will it take in normal and heavy traffic situations? So not just how long will it take to load them, but how long will it actually take you to get to where you're going? How many vehicles do you need and how many helpers do you need to get all your animals out? Um, we hear this so often. I've got a great truck and a great trailer and um, it'll hold three horses, but I actually have seven plus the goats and the sheep and a big dog who won't fit in the back of my car. You have to factor all that in ahead of time and make sure that you have enough resources and helpers to get everybody out 
quickly and safely. Next slide. A few more considerations. Uh, how many rigs can safely and quickly enter, load, and get out of your location? This is really important if you are asking for help from the animal disaster response teams. We will usually send a, a scout car ahead before the rigs ever enter that location to make sure that there actually is room to turn around, determine can we get more than one rig in there. But that's really important. Be realistic and be truthful when you're giving information to the dispatch call takers. Will you need vet assistance? Might you need pain meds to help some of these animals? Do you need to put leg wraps on everybody? Or might they need some technical assistance? These are all things that are going to require a lot of time to prepare. Factor that in. Your special needs animals um, are just that. They're special. They're important or you wouldn't have them with you. And just like little kids and older people, everything about transporting them and evacuating them and keeping them safe during an evacuation is going to require a lot of extra thought. That all goes into your disaster action plan. So sick animals are another consideration. If you have to evacuate and you have somebody who's already sick, uh, you really need to think about how you're going to transport them. If you have to rely on a response resource, in other words, not yourself to move them, you need to be upfront with that resource if this animal is sick, because once the animal's unloaded, you need to be able to clean that trailer thoroughly so the next animal that gets in it does not pick up what the sick animal had. When you get to your evacuation destination, you need to be very clear about that animal's condition, especially uh, if it has been diagnosed or has some suspicious symptoms. In an emergency of animal shelter, your animal will be placed in a quarantine or isolation ward so that it can be monitored carefully by the vets and it reduces the opportunity for it to spread its infection to others. Really important. Next slide. Prepping your animals for evac. Again, this means ID on everybody, including visible ID if they're microchipped and get your equines microchipped. You can do it. Move them to a confined, easy access pen, corral, or arena. This means that during that uh, weather advisory, you're gonna get everybody up close so that when it's time to load, you don't have to waste time going out and catching them. That's really important. And if something happens quickly, it becomes even more important. Have good halters and lead ropes for everybody and have extras. How those halters and lead ropes where you can get to them quickly. And we had a situation here in Sonoma Valley in the, during the Kincaid fire where a portable barn building collapsed because of the wind uh, and a couple of horses were trapped inside it. All of the halters and lead ropes for all of the 14 horses were attached to the stall doors. Where do we usually keep our, our halters and lead ropes? On the stalls or on the pens. All those halters and lead ropes were completely inaccessible because they were under the collapsed barn. Fortunately, that person um, who travels as an entertainer with her equines had a whole set of ropes and halters in her trailer. So really important to think about. And make sure you have extras. Next slide. Where will you go? Who will help you? Again, have multiple plans and destinations. Rely on your personal resource network and plan on hard to load animals. Um, even your best haulers and best loaders may balk when they sense that something is up. So again, plan plenty of time into your plan. Next slide. Sheltering in place. We're gonna talk about wildfire for a minute because again, in the West, this is one of the, if not the most frequent danger. And it's the one that most frequently ends up with a lot of large animals sheltered in place. They could be commercial livestock herds. They could be horses that we can't get to quickly enough. Um, any one of uh, many reasons um, ends up with animals sheltering in place. So if you are thinking that the best plan is to leave your animals sheltered in place, 
here are some of the things to factor into that decision. Is that space defensible? If you have irrigated or dry lot pasture, that's gonna be ideal. How far is that space from a radiant heat source? And this means heavy brush or timber, um, big flammable barns, a hay barn, uh, because sometimes the fire itself isn't the danger, it's the radiant heat from the fire. So again, situational awareness, look around at everything that could impact their safety. Do you have secure fire safe fencing? So you're looking at a picture here of a, a really, really safe defensible space. There's nothing there that's gonna burn. Uh, the grass is short, the animals can move away from it. And they've got really strong sturdy fencing with metal posts that's not going to be destroyed in the fire. If your animals are safe in their pasture, but their fence burns down, now you have frantic loose equines and livestock. Next slide. Here is a little graphic um, courtesy of the Fire Safe Council um, that we made together last year. And this just gives you a really good idea of all of the defensible space minimums. So make sure that you have those lean, green, and clean barriers. Everything that you do for your home applies just as much to your chicken coop, your barn, your shed, your animal runs. Make sure that if your animals are normally in a barn, that you have a run out for them. You can turn them into that pen, shut the barn or stall doors behind them so that they can't turn around and go back because that's what they do. They will run back into their safe place, even if it's on fire. And make sure that there's access for emergency vehicles. If the fire engine can't get to you, they can't defend your property and help keep your animals safe. Next slide. Creating refuge space for animals, things to think about, the dangers in each type of incident. Here we have some pictures of some of the really big ones. So you've got um, roadway dangers, hazard trees, steep slopes, canyons, uh, power lines. Again, uh, power lines are one of probably the single greatest hazard in almost every kind of natural disaster. Fuel tanks, including small uh, backyard, like 10 and 25 gallon propane tanks that can become unguided missiles. Um, are you in a flood zone? Is your animal place in a flood zone? Underground gas lines, those can be disrupted in a variety of incidents. Uh, barbed wire fences that animals can get tangled up in if they're running in a panic or worse, when they're submerged underwater and they're unseen. So again, look up, look down, look all around and don't wait for a disaster to do that. Do it now so that your plans for your animal spaces, keep them as far from harm's way as possible. Next slide. Sheltering in place risks. The time to think about these is now. Uh, one of the things that we often don't think about enough is um, air ops. Are our animals in danger if incident command does not know where they are? and they're in an area where they're planting uh, airdrops of water or retardant, or is the fact that those animals are there going to prevent emerge firefighters from um, using air operations? And those are really important things to think about. So it's essential that your emergency services know where those animals are. Even if you feel that they're really safe, when you leave, when you get to a safe place, let your local fire department know. Let the sheriff's deputy or the highway patrol or police officer at the roadblock know. Call animal control, call the hotline and let them know where those animals are. Um, that is critical for both the safety of your animals and the safety of our first responders. And I think we've talked about most of these other hazards. Uh, one that we haven't hit on yet is the Good Samaritan. And these are the people who have uh, gold in their hearts. They have every good intention. Um, they're trying to rescue your animals, but maybe your animals don't need to be rescued. Um, maybe you have trouble finding them uh, later. Um, and maybe they have turned them loose without letting anyone know. Uh, they could be exposing them or other animals to disease. So that is a hazard. If someone sees animals sheltered in place, 
they may assume those animals are abandoned and in danger and they may try to do something about it. So again, if you have let emergency services know by calling the hotline that there are animals sheltered in place, they're gonna get that information out, okay? So think about that. Next slide. Assessing, whoop, okay, responders. Responders can't help you if they can't get in. Boy, our firefighters tell us this over and over. When you leave, make sure your gates are unlocked and you've disabled your electric openers. Provide a detailed site map to your local animal control or fire department, preferably both. Make sure you are maintaining vehicle clearance, which is around here where we are in Sonoma County and most other jurisdictions, a minimum clearance height of 13 feet, six inches, a minimum width of 12 feet with a foot on either side of the shoulders and turning access of a minimum of 30 feet horizontally. So this is what it takes for modern firefighting vehicles, particularly in the wildland urban interface to get into your property. If they can't get in, they can't help. Next slide. Uh, animals on the property have a whiteboard or a metal painted sign that you've written on that gives responders information about your animals. A uh, little reminder here about the importance of reflective signs with numbers on both sides. They are really important, not just in the daytime, but in nighttime when you're standing out there with a flashlight, a headlamp, or um, your vehicle headlights. Those things need to be installed in a place where they are defensible and they're not going to blow down, get knocked down or burned down. Next slide. A site map that shows all your infrastructure, where the hazards might be, where the people and the animals might be located and where resources are available for your first responders. Local fire departments love this. So this is something that you can make, you can take it to your fire department, you can leave it with animal control and you should post them in a couple of places around your property. Also have one or two copies in your emergency binder or your emergency file so that if you need to, you have one handy that you can give to someone. Uh, people worry about security, but security is all over the place. What you really wanna be thinking about is helping responders to keep you, your property, your animals, and the surrounding area as safe as possible. And this will really be a, a big help. Next slide. Vehicle prep. Okay, do a safety inspection. You can write us and ask us for a vehicle safety inspection form, and we'll be happy to provide one to you that is used by all of the animal disaster response teams in our state. Uh, make sure you have a full tank of gas, Make sure if you're towing a trailer that it's hooked up and facing out, which is what your vehicle should be, out of the garage, facing the street, ready to go. Your tools, supplies, and your personal protective equipment are ready to go, ready at hand. If you have livestock trailers, a horse trailer, if you're gonna be moving animals in a trailer, remove the bedding. This is really important in fire and wind and flooding, the bedding is a hazard, it's a danger. Close the windows, you don't want stuff blowing in there. So important things to remember that are different from when we're hitting the road for a horse show or a fun vacation. Next slide. Equine ready kits, vehicle ready kits in both Spanish and English, we got them, you can have them, they're free. Next slide. Um, more ready kit information in Spanish. And these are all checklists that you can print out in eight and a half by 11 form. First aid kit for large animals. Again, build a first aid kit for all the animals in your care. Make sure you've talked with your vet about the medications, pain relief, and other critical supplies that you can add that may be next to impossible or impossible to get in the aftermath of a disaster. Make sure you have enough medications, parasite control, supplements, special diet food, et cetera, for at least four to six weeks. Learn how to stabilize your animals, check vital signs, clean and treat wounds, and assess animal condition. Talk to your vet, 
take a first aid course. Next slide. After a disaster, some common health issues. So this is a frequently asked question. Um, obviously lacerations, puncture wounds are big ones. Eye injury, probably the most common, especially for animals with large eyes, but your cats and dogs are uh, very susceptible to stuff that's in the air, um, on the ground, the ash and the smoke. Um, skin and respiratory problems caused by submersion in water or exposure to smoke and other air toxicity. Fractures and connective tissue injuries. So bigger injuries that are gonna be scarier, but it behooves us, no pun intended, to um, find ourselves in a position where we can stabilize those injuries if we have to. Colic and laminitis, if you're eating, equine owners, these are really big ones. Uh, even if your animal appears to be okay, could be really stressed out, changes in the environment, the sheltering, um, food, all of these things, as we know, can cause uh, horses to develop stress colic, which can lead to laminitis. So things to, again, be very aware of. Climate control, hypothermia, or and or heat stress or heat stroke. And these can obviously occur um, as a result of the same incident. So the takeaway here is know what to look for and know how to assess what's going on with your animal. Next slide. Large animal supplies for evacuation. Make sure you have what you need and that you have enough. If you're sheltering in place, again, make sure you have enough feed and most especially water for at least a month protecting your water supply and being able to transport water is enormously important. Here we have a little poster that uh, we actually made for Goldridge Fire a couple of years ago at their request. And uh, again, it's available to you if, you if you'd like a little cheat sheet on some interesting ways to store water, maybe for your neighborhood, maybe for your uh, neighborhood safety shed or just for yourself or your club. Next slide. Water, water, water. Is your water source secure? Do you have enough storage? And how much can you take with you? Here's a little cheat sheet that might be a wake up call. You'd be surprised if you don't already know how much water your animals require. So you can download this and of course know how much people need, which is generally one to three gallons per day, depending upon um, the size, the age and the physical condition. So. We need a lot of water and without it, we're going to go downhill fast and that goes for our animals as well. Next slide. Site prep for sheltering in place. When you get a weather watch or warning or a red flag, that's the time to make it safer. So we have a list of things. These are available as cards that we can provide you with or checklists. And we've already pretty much talked about most of them. Um, relocating feed and bedding away from a flammable area is a big one. Removing hazards that can blow around in the wind, making sure the fences and gates are secure. Um, adding water storage and troughs. So that means just adding the actual containers that you can fill up with water before you go. And you might soak the area and make a wallow if the weather is really, really hot or you're worried that a fire might come near or through. Next slide. Prepping the animals to shelter in place, have visible ID, remove their masks, their halters, their blankets, and their wraps, super important. Turn them out of their barns and sheds and close the doors. Hose down the animals if you have time, braid their manes and tie up tails so they can't uh, trap debris, get caught up in something or um, catch an ember and start to burn. Check for loose shoes if you can and tap them back into place. And if you're preparing for flood, obviously move everybody to the highest ground possible, which is also what you're going to do if you get a tsunami alert. Next slide. Know when to go. Early action saves lives. Understanding the stages of evacuation and when to go. We've gone through this. We have it here again because again, we can't say it enough time. The time to leave with your large animals is before an evacuation order is issued, and that includes evacuation warnings. Go during that advisory, go during that weather watch, go when you have plenty of time 
to do it in the best possible circumstances. Do not wait to evacuate. Next slide. Animals inside an evacuation zone, who can enter? So you're gonna get yourself to safety, you're gonna get on the hotline and you are going to call and request assistance for your animals inside the evacuation zone. And this response is gonna be provided by authorized animal response resources coordinated by emergency managers and working under the incident command. When permitted, commercial equine and livestock property owners, staff and their resources and vendors will be allowed in under the Ag Pass program, which exists in our county and many others. Residents being escorted by an animal control officer, a law enforcement officer, the fire service, or other authorized agency response resources are sometimes allowed to access their properties as well. Next slide. In our county and many other parts of California and the West, Ag Pass programs exist or are being developed. And the time to find out if you qualify for an Ag, Ag Pass program is right now. And you do that by getting in touch with your local Ag Commissioner or Farm Bureau and asking them what you would need to do and if you qualify for an Ag Pass that would enable you and your vendors or resources to get into your property. And Ag Passes are designed for commercial producers. So these are commercial livestock producers and also commercial crop producers who have animals such as small ruminants on their properties. Okay, so a really important thing to find out about. You can't just go flying in there, uh, even if you're the dairy owner or the beef cattle rancher or um, a biodynamic vineyard owner with a bunch of cattle and goats on your property. Next slide. Help your non, our, our non-English speaking workers and our neighbors stay safe. Um, provide and share resources in their language, have verbal trainings and practice drills in their language. Um, a lot of our workers come from places where the communication is through spoken language and not written. So we have a lot of workers who are not literate in their language, let alone English. And so communicating verbally and in person is really important. Make sure they know how to call for help in an emergency or disaster. And again, we are really fortunate that 911 and call 211 all have resources available for translation in many languages. Make sure that your workers and your neighbors know this. Next slide. Again, more Spanish language materials. We have a lot and we would love to share them with you. Next slide. Resources, just take a quick screenshot. Again, we're gonna give all this to you. I wanna speed through so that I can give you a couple more quick tips before our Zoom expires. So next shot, next slide. Uh, knowledge is safety. This is one of my takeaways. If you're not safe, you can't help your family, your animals and other people. You're not alone. There are resources to help you. That's why we're here tonight. Take a class and here are some great ways to start. Um, you can take an all hazards health and safety class. Wildland safety, which is really interesting become a ham radio operator. We have lots and lots of people would love to help you do that. Um, take a first aid or CPR class and think about taking an animal first aid course. And uh, here's my cat, Jax, enjoying a training with me. Next slide. Keep calm and be ready for whatever. This is our halter project mantra. So now, we are almost to the end of our time together. We have one more module and I'm gonna blast through this really quickly. Um, this is about volunteers. So Mason, next slide. This is a snapshot of animal disaster responders. They come in all shapes, sizes, ages, levels of ability. They are professionals, they're volunteers, they're veterinarians, they're radio operators, they're animal handlers, rig drivers. Uh, they're people with communication and navigation skills. Basically, almost anybody can become 
an animal disaster volunteer if they're willing to train and share their skills. There is a role for everyone. Next slide. What's a cart? We're asked this all the time. Well, a cart is a community animal response team. So just as tonight is being hosted by a CERT, a community emergency response team, in this case, the Jacob Bays, carts are the animal equivalent. So we are responders who do a lot of training. Um, we are authorized by um, our jurisdiction and often many other and we are activated when there is a disaster so that we can deploy and help animals responding to orders and operating under a unified command system. Next slide. There are lots of roles and positions. I just ran through a bunch of them. If you find your slot here and you'd like to be an animal disaster responder, we're gonna tell you where to go to get the information to do it. Next slide. Uh, animal search and rescue. This is one type of animal disaster responder. And this is what pe people usually think of. These are the people who are authorized to go inside an evacuation zone and either evacuate animals or care for animals sheltered in place. So this is one of the very highest um, skill levels, obviously, because um, people are entering places that are inherently dangerous. And this level does require a lot of training. Training, it's rigorous. We train pretty much year round to do this. Um, if you're interested, you can find out about it by joining a local community animal response team. Next slide. And an important fact, even animal disaster service workers, those are animal disaster volunteers, do not self-deploy. We do not, we cannot, we will not, and neither should you. So every position is working under unified incident command. We take orders and we are responding and deploying, uh, utilizing the utmost in safety standards and protocols. We all work together. We take orders from the top. Next slide. Who provides veterinary care? Uh, another question that's asked all the time. Well, it starts with the local veterinarians who are volunteering, um, usually at the emergency small and large animal shelters. As things get bigger and the local vets become overwhelmed or maybe running out of supplies, our jurisdiction can call other resources. Um, in our area, again, California, we are really blessed to have the University of California Davis Veterinary Emergency Response Team. We also have in California, the veterinary equivalent of a medical reserve corps, and that is CAVMARC, the California Veterinary Medical Reserve Corps. And sometimes we even get animal disaster response teams from out of state. And again, that's how incident command works. The bigger the incident, the further afield our agencies will request mutual aid assistance. And animal disaster volunteers like me train so that if another county needs us, we're trained to be able to fit seamlessly into the operation and provide them with help. Next slide. How to become an animal disaster volunteer. Bunch of different ways. You can get all that you need to know by contacting your local CART. We've also got a great how-to page at halterproject.org. Um, sign up to volunteer at a local animal shelter. That's another great way to get your foot in the door. Okay, we want you. We need you. And regardless of how much time, skill, training you're willing to invest, there is a place for you and you can add tremendous value. Next slide. Other ways to help, become a CERT volunteer, um, become a ham radio operator, take Red Cross shelter training and or start a neighborhood group like a COPE, which is a safety, or I'm sorry, a COPE or a neighborhood safety committee or block supervisor program and COPE for those if you don't know, it's a really robust program here in our county, and it's communities organizing to prepare for emergencies. So COPES, we have some great ones. So uh, get in touch with your local CERT. At the beginning of this presentation, we gave you information for contacting the Dega Base CERT. 
We also have some other resources in Sonoma County. And we have a resource slide at the end that you can take a quick photo of. And I think Mason, we, you, we may lose you at eight o'clock. I think our Zoom is going to expire. So Mason, can you move our slide? Oh, there we go. Volunteer resources, take a picture. And again, we can make all this information available to you. Next slide. More resources. These are global resources. These are all of the national and international resources who help animals in disaster, and they are great places to get information. But our local resources on the next slide, North Bay and Coastal Resources, again, take a screenshot and we'll make this information available after the presentation. Lots and lots of great local resources. Biggest takeaway here is always start with your counties emergency services website. So in a lot of counties, it's gonna say ready.cov. It might be ready Sonoma, ready Marin. That's the place to go to get started. And that pretty much wraps up our presentation. Halter Project, again, has lots of resources and this is our message to you. Thank you for joining us. Stay safe, be ready for whatever, and I don't know, I can take a few questions if there are some and we'll see if Zoom lets us keep going. Thank you all for sticking with me. This was two hours and I see that uh, we have close to 50 people still hanging in there. So thank you all. Um, you can write to us at halterproject.org or get in touch with Bodega Bay CERT to find out how to find this presentation so you can watch it again and share it with your friends. Any questions, Mason? Uh, yeah, I did get okay. a couple. Let's try. Let's go for it. Uh, a couple Jennifer, questions. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I did get a couple questions from George. Uh, should large animal transfer vehicles allow priority for autos full of people when trying to evacuate on narrow, damaged roads? I'm not sure I understand that question, George. I think that what you're saying is what takes priority: an animal transport vehicle or a car full of people. And the answer to that is that um, animal transport vehicles inside an evacuation zone are managed by the incident command. So they're in communication with incident command um, and the emergency responders on the road will be monitoring vehicles with humans. So uh, the, the answer to that is it will depend entirely on the safety. If there is room for an animal transport vehicle to pull off to the side and let other vehicles pass, it will do so, but usually traffic is going to be managed by uh, sheriff's deputies, highway patrol, uh, possibly fire. And so there is, there is no one answer to that question other than safety is number one at all times. Great. Uh, another question George asks is, are animals more or less susceptible to smoke inhalation problems than humans? And what can be done for it when evacuation is not possible? George, I would love to introduce you to some of my veterinary friends. Animals are extremely susceptible. Um, some animals more than others. Uh, equines get a lot of respiratory problems. Small ruminants um, we're finding, so goats especially, are really susceptible. And many of our pets and our birds uh, suffer a lot of problems, especially if you have animals that are brachycephalic. So those are like our pug-nosed dogs and cats. Uh, they have more problems. Birds are very fragile. So the answer is yes. And there are um, a lot of different things that can be done. I am not a veterinarian, so I do not and cannot deliver veterinary advice, but I'd be happy to connect you with some resources. Or we could have a vet come and give a presentation. Great, another question asked was, I was told in the past, this is from Jen Payne Pearson, I was told in the past not to worry about feed when evacuating, is this not accurate? Uh, usually when people say feed, they're talking about hay or grain. No, it's really important, that is not accurate. It is really important that your animals 
are able to stay on the kind of food and diet that they are accustomed to, especially if you have ruminants or equines. So take as much as you can take with you, even if it's only enough for a day or two. So no, that is not accurate. Uh, to keep your animals healthy, you need to take their food and if possible, water from the source that they're used to with you. Good question. Um, Kelly Hendricks asks, which hotline number do you keep referring to? Hi, Kelly. Okay, we actually have a resource slide that gives you the, uh, makes available the hotline numbers for all of the North Bay animal hotlines. So when I'm referring to an animal disaster hotline, that is the number that is going to be posted in an emergency alert. That's why we say repeatedly, follow the instructions in, in your emergency alerts, know how to get your emergency alerts and keep, keep the hotline numbers handy. So if Kelly, if you'd like that, just get in touch with us at Halter Project and we'll send you information about all of the local North Bay disaster animal hotlines, but keep in mind, that those numbers can change depending upon the incident. So it's possible that the number you have in your contacts might be different in a particular incident and an additional number or a new number will be posted in emergency, um, emergency alerts. So the hotline I'm referring to is the animal disaster hotline for your jurisdiction or the particular incident you're dealing with. Another good question. Great. Uh, this was from earlier in, in the presentation, but uh, uh, Rose asked, I would like to ask the access the different emergency question cards. Thank you. Where, oh, where can that Rose, be send us an email at rescue at halterfund.org. And we will send you whatever you like. And that goes for everybody. I think that our email address, it's, it's all over the place. Uh, it's actually down there at the bottom of the slide you're looking at right now. And I think it was also pasted into the chat. So again, that's rescue at halterfund.org. Great, uh, that's all the questions I saw in the chat. I mean, besides that, there are some uh, very useful uh, resources and messages that other people have sent for everyone, so. Oh, super. Uh, we will have a look at those and we'll try to incorporate them into um, the resource slide when we prepare this uh, presentation for later distribution. I want to thank everybody um, for staying with us. And again, tell your friends and neighbors about halterproject.org. Tell them about the database cert or other certs and get involved. You are pebbles in our preparedness pond. For every one of you we reach, you have the ability to share this information with dozens of others. And that's how we all work together to keep ourselves, our animals, and our communities safe. So thank you all. And safe travels, even if it's just upstairs to your bedroom. Bye. You're welcome, Annette. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. So, okay, looks like people are checking out and we have um, Mason and Shiloh, can you capture the information in the chat? Mason, excellent job and thank you. Yeah, of course, no problem. Uh, glad to help. Um, Couldn't have done it without you. Did you find it, get, learn anything new for your little kittens? <laughs> yeah, I mean, definitely learned a lot of, a lot of things. Uh, just important to have, to get all my I don't know, go bags and even shelter in place materials in order. Is it is. Thing. Kitties are hard. Kitties know instantly when something's up and they're going to go hide and you may not be able to <laughs> get them. So it's really important to, and I can, I can share more things with you about that. We tried to cover many topics tonight in broad strokes because it's a huge topic and we're dealing, you know, we're talking about human safety and preparedness. It's not so hard. We're talking about one species, but when we're talking about animals, we are talking about dozens of species, different needs, different living conditions.
questions. Um, it's just a big, big, big topic, and there's a lot to cover. But thank you for doing an excellent job advancing the slides. Thank you, Shiloh. Thank you, Bodega Bay Search. And I just want to make sure that we've captured um, the yeah, information. I just got it. I just okay, got it. great. All right. Uh, anybody still left from Bodega Bay Search who wants to ask me a question? We can unmute you. No questions. Everybody's checking out. All right. Good night. Sweet dreams. All right. Th thanks so much, Mason. That was really great. Mason, that was First awesome. Problem. Yeah. Very First. good. Thank you. All right. Julia, let's talk. Okay. Okay. Who's left? Right. Who's, good night, who's everyone. Here? All right. Good night, everyone. I'm going to end. I'm going to end. Yeah. Okay. Bye, everybody.